Masechet Moed Katan, we begin with Daf Bet. Uh, we want to first thank David Kasky for sponsoring this Masechet uh, in honor of his triplets. Uh, he is celebrating his own uh, mini uh, Moed, and so uh, that's very appropriate that he sponsored this Moed Katan. Okay, this is the second to last Masechet in uh, the Seder of Moed, and uh, the subject is Moed Katan, a small Moed. What is a small Moed? It's referring to Chol HaMoed, the in-between days uh, during of Pesach and Sukkot. On the one hand, they are Moed, they're biblical holidays, and so we have to be celebrating. On the other hand, uh, we're not restricted from all All the laws of Avelut, uh, which are very important and, uh, you know, sadly are, are relevant, but uh, important because it's through those uh, through those rituals that we find comfort uh, and, and are able to come and comfort those uh, those in need. And so this is uh, actually a very important, um, a very, very important uh, Masechet. And so now to the principles of work and what's per- permitted and prohibited on Chola Moed. Okay, it's a strange in-between category. Uh, that we have to explain. Why should some things be allowed and some things not allowed? Is it the oraita? Is it the rabbanan? And for this, we have a Gemara in uh, Masechet Chagiga, uh, 18a, which says regarding this principle, lo nakatuv ela lecha chamim, lo malecha eze melacha asura ve'ezo melacha muteret. Uh, the, the Torah itself, does not specify what's permitted and prohibited on Chola Moed. It just says, in general, this is a holiday, so celebrate. Of course, we can't prohibit people from doing all melacha for seven days or eight days straight. And so therefore, the Torah leaves it open-ended for the rabbis to come later and legislate and think about it and decide uh, what is an appropriate amount that you should uh, celebrate and refrain from work? And where is it appropriate that, yes, it's okay to do some work? And so that's exactly what the rabbis do throughout the first two perakim of this Masechet. We're going to see our opening Mishnah. It's going to lay out three principles. It's not going to say them explicitly. It's going to lay it out through examples. Uh, so let's see what the rules are. Number one, uh, basically, melacha is not allowed unless there is significant financial loss. Um, this is different from gain. If you're not gaining, like you're just not doing a sale, right? Store is closed. We're not going to be selling, uh, so you shouldn't go and gain. But if it's going to, if if there's something that's going to occur, financial loss. If you're selling uh, fruit or something that expires, it's going to go bad, and you're going to lose all the merchandise. Then you can do something to save from financial loss, but not to uh, to to gain extra profit. Okay, that's principle number one. Principle number two is that. It's prohibited if it's strenuous work, right? It seems even if there's financial loss, if it's going to be very strenuous work, you have to work very hard, many hours, um, and take a, you know, to use use a lot of physical strength. That's not appropriate for the holiday, and you know, even if that means some some loss. Okay, and third is that if there is a public need then that's permitted, right? The first two principles only for something private, but if the public need roads and things, then we're allowed to work for in, uh, for that. Okay, so let's see how these principles uh, play out in the following cases. Mashkin bet hashlachin b'moed u'bashevirit. Okay, a little terminology. Bet hashlachin means an irrigated field as, as opposed to sadeh uh, bet ha'ba'al, uh, which is uh, does not depend on irrigation. Okay, bet hashlachin. It seems to come. The Gemara will talk about the the terminology, but it seems to come from the word lishloach that you have to draw water, you have to send water to it. So an example of this would be, let's say you have a field that's on a mountain, and so the rainwater keeps going down, or you're growing some kind of crops, grains that require a tremendous amount of water, and rain is not enough, so it has to be irrigated. That takes more work. Whereas a bet habaal is something that is relies on rain only and does not need to be irrigated. Okay, so bet hashlachin is going to be a case where we will have financial loss. If we don't water an, a, a, a field that needs irrigation, then everything will die. Anything that started to grow and it's going to miss, miss out on water for a week, and that's it. It'll be ruined. And so this is a case of significant financial loss. And therefore... On Cholamoed, we say Moed, obviously not Yom Tov, 
uh, on Chol Moed and on Shevi'it. Okay, we're going to throw in, a uh, weave in Shevi'it laws here, even though um, on Shevi'it is a different is a different category. Shevi'it also you're not allowed to work the land. Um, I mean, you can do strenuous work, but uh, 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 plowing and planting are prohibited on the on Shevi'it. Nevertheless, watering is permitted on the Shevi'it, and the Gemara will discuss why. Okay, so ben mimayan she yasab techila, ben mimayan she lo yasab batechila. You are allowed to water this garden, that, that this field that needs irrigation from a spring, any kind of spring, whether it's a new spring that just sprung forth or uh, it's one that was around for a while. Either way is allowed. Why do we have to say this will be the difference? Well, if a spring is around for a while, then we know it's there, it's reliable. A new spring that just comes up we f- could fear that it may collapse, right? The, the, the walls of it may all of a sudden collapse and then the owner will be forced to go and dig it out and that will be a, an, a, a lot of exertion. And so the Mishnah is teaching, we don't worry about that. If, if the spring is, is running, even if it's new, we don't worry that it will collapse and it won't lead to a lot of work. And so what you see here is that in a case of great need, that's an, an, a field that requires irrigation, otherwise it will die you're allowed to do a small amount of exertion and just help the spring water get there. But you cannot do a lot of work. And that would be if you had rainwater that was collected in a cistern and you'd have to go and draw it, um, uh, 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 draw it with a lever, maybe something like this, which is called a kilon. Uh, or any other drawn water is prohibited. So if a spring is there, spring is going by itself, and you just direct it to where it needs to go, that's permitted. But doing a lot of wor- work is not allowed, even if it will incur a financial loss. Good. Then, osin ugiyot la gefanim. When they had grapevines, they would, so they would sometimes make circular ditches around the vine, so that would collect the water there. Um, that is not allowed to do on Cholamad because it requires a lot of exer- exertion. So no good. Rabbi El Azar ben Azaria Omer and Osina Ta'ama Batechila Bamoed Uba Shevirit. Rabbi El Azar ben Azaria, we're going to see, is stricter than, other, than others. And he says that in Ama, which is a water channel, one may not make a new water channel on Cholamad. That's a lot of exertion. Also, not on Shevirit. Um, Chachamim disagree regarding Shevi'it. After all, on Shevi'it, you're not allowed to plant and plow, it's true, but you're allowed to water. Um, and so therefore, the problem is not exertion. It's on Shevi'it. I was talking about a regular weekday, happens to be during Shevi'it, so you can exert yourself and make a new uh, aqueduct or water channel that is permitted on Shevi'it. They agree, though, that on Ma'ed, that's too much exertion to make a new water channel. And uh, what you can do is if you have a water channel that was damaged, then you're allowed to fix it on, uh, uh, on the holiday because that's not a lot of exertion, um, right? Just to fix one you know, section of it, some dirt fell in, some rocks fell in. And furthermore, and now we get to the third principle, which is for public good. Um, if there is a cistern that was damaged and now the, there's uh, dirt uh, 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 or sewage going into the, into the drinking water, this is necessary for the public. So you can, we can fix it. So we can uh, clean them out and we can all clean out those cisterns. We can also fix the roads and the streets if they have potholes or bumpy, and we can fix the mikvaot. If the mikvaot are uh, dirty uh, or leaking, these are only a few examples, but you can do anything for public need. Uh, two more examples are we can mark graves. Sometimes a, a gravestone might fall down or get lost. And so we want to make sure to mark the graves so that everybody will know that if you pass over here, you'll become Tameh. That's needed. That's a public good. And also, we'll send out messengers uh, regarding Kilayim to say, hey, everybody, go check your fields and see if there are diverse um, uh, uh, species growing. Then even if you didn't plant them, they're just growing on their own. You're still responsible and you have to uproot one of them. 
And so uh, we do that also. It's not clear why the word af is here. We have seen af al hakilayim. Like what else? We didn't mention anything else that we are sending messengers for. Uh, the word af here is actually a holdover copied from the source of this law, which was in Masechet Shekalim. In Masechet Shekalim, it said that we send out messengers on the, on the first uh, of Adad regarding HaMachazit shekel. Hey, everybody, you have to give Machazit shekel, And also on Kilayim. And that's why at the end of that, we said, V'yotzin af ala Kilayim. We also send out for Kilayim. So it's in the context. And you see here that a lot of the other things are also similar, that uh, in the beginning of Adad, not only do we announce Machazit shekel, or then on the 15th, we read Megillah. And right on that day, we also fix the roads and the mikvaot and do everything for public good and mark the graves. And we also send out messengers. So they see this is the source. Um, and uh, this section is copied from Masechet Shekalim to Masechet Moed Katan. And that's why the af is kept in, even though it's not referring to anything in, in Moed Katan. Okay, that's fascinating. Whenever you see something like that, you get a little insight into uh, the, uh, the uh, composition of the Mishnah. All right, and that concludes the Mishnah. And now the Gemara, we have a, an outline here of what we're going to see. <laughs> the Gemara first is going to explain why does the Mishnah need to permit the pre-existing spring? Uh, why do you have to tell me that, right? Since, a, um, since even a new spring is permitted, so then of course a pre-existing spring would also be permitted. So we can explain that. Then we explain some terminology. And then we're going to ask who is the author of the Mishnah? We're going to offer two opinions, two possibilities, the Be'elaz ben Yaakov and the Rebbe Yehuda. And then we're going to go into, well, it's somewhat of a tangent, but it'll be related. What is the melacha for watering and weeding since they're not one of the 39 melachot? To which category do they apply? Okay, so now, starting with uh, a question on the beginning of the Mishnah, Hashta. Yesh lomar mim ayan da telim pule mashkin. The Mishnah said that uh, you are allowed to use a uh, water from a new spring. Um, and we have to net, we have to say that in order to irrigate a field that needs irrigation, because even though it might fall because it's a new spring, nevertheless, it's permitted. So once you tell me that, then from an old spring uh, where I'm not worried about it falling, do you even have to tell me that case? Don't even bother. I can figure it out on my own. And the answer is Amri Istirich. Itana Ma'ayan Shia Sabatechilav Amin Hahu de Beta Shlachin in Beta Baal La. No, no good. If he only told me that. Um, in a, a new spring is allowed, I would say that in the case of a new spring, that's where we have a division between a field that requires irrigation and betabal that does not require irrigation. That the one that requires irrigation, yes, that's okay because there's a great need. In that case, you can use a new spring. But in, uh, in, a, a, in a field that does not require irrigation, then you wouldn't be able to use a new one. So the split between these two types of fields only applies with a new spring, because I'm worried it might fall and it doesn't really need, it's only for profit. But if so, if I only had that case, then I would say that um, a, an old spring where I don't have to worry that I'm gonna have to do any exertion because I don't have to worry about the, the, about the walls falling, uh, then I would say maybe a non-irrigated field also would be permitted. I could get bring that water and just uh, direct it towards this non-irrigated field because it's very little work. I don't have to worry. So maybe there's no difference between the types of fields regarding an old spring, only regarding a new spring. That's what I would have thought if you didn't tell me both cases. Therefore, kamash malan, la shena ma'ayan shi yasa betechila, ve la shena ma'ayan shi lo yasa betechila, be tashlachin in, be tabal la. Therefore, the Gemara teacher gives me both cases, and it doesn't matter, both in a, an, a new spring and in an old spring, why right, we have this distinction that an irrigated field is permitted because otherwise it'll be lost. Whereas a non-irrigated field is not permitted because there the extra water would gain me more profit, but without it, I'm not gonna have substantial loss. 
All right, very good. So now we explain that. Now we go to the terminology. How do I know that the word means uh, a field that is thirsty and requires uh, more water than just rain? It requires irrigation. Um, regarding Amalek, it says, and you were uh, faint and weary, a double language. I mean, they basically mean the same thing. Why both? Well, look at the Targum Unculus, Umatargiminan, Veat Mishalhe Velae. And you were, Mishalhe means thirsty. Now, Mishalhe is not the same as Shlachin, because one's with the He and one's with the Chet. One's in Aramaic, one's in Hebrew. Nevertheless, Chet and He were, uh, were, were uh, pronounced in a similar way back then. And so they were interchangeable. So, Mishalhe. Uh, means thirsty, and that's the origin of hashlachin, which means a thirsty field. Okay, that's the Gemara's derivation. Um, I think it could be simpler, just like sh- shalach, that you have to send water there. You have to draw water and bring it there in some through through uh, irrigation ditches. All right, that's one. And the other language, And when we say betabal, that means a, a field that is good on its own, like a field maybe in a valley where it collects all the rainwater there and it doesn't require any further irrigation. How do we know that betabal means being settled and comfortable on its own? Pasuk from Yeshaya, like a young man takes a maiden to himself. Uh, so is referring to Eretz Israel and Bnei Israel that the land of Israel will uh, take uh, take its children when the return of exile and they'll live happily ever after. So metargeminan and there the targum is are kema demitotav ulam aim betulta yatebon begavech benayich. Um, just like. A young man and young woman settle down to mitotav, like lashevet, uh, means they're 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 comfortable and happy and settled. And so too, that's a good translation because I mean, uh, from the comparison, right? Kival bachur betula is not referring to the act of intimacy of a marital relations between them, because then it wouldn't make sense with the nimshal, which is about Jews coming back and settling in the land of Israel. But rather, it's referring to a young man and woman who get married and now they feel settled. They can build a home together and relax. And so too, uh, when, when the Jews go back to the land of Israel, we'll be able to relax and not be on the run and be in exile. Okay, the point here is that the word kiv al, bachur, a baal, a husband, is someone who feels settled. And that's why we call this type of field bet ha-baal, uh, the field of a, um, a someone who is an owner, and uh, therefore, since it doesn't it relies on rain only and doesn't require irrigation, the owner feels settled. I know that this field will get what it needs, assuming there's an appropriate amount of rain, and it doesn't have to do a lot of go extra work and go and find water and bring it. Okay, so that's the derivation. Now, Mantana de Peseda in Harvacha La. We want to know who is the author of our Mishnah that holds of this principle. I mean, our Mishnah was, uh, was anonymous, except for the Bilazar ben Nazariah, who was more stringent. But, so who is the anonymous Tanakama? Um, now, what does he hold? He says that uh, you are allowed to do work on Cholomo'ed to prevent loss, Pesedain, but for, for profit, no, it's not allowed. And furthermore, the second principle that this, our Tanakh holds is that even in the case of financial loss, you can't do a lot of exertion, a lot of work. Who's going to have both of these principles? And we're going to look from Tanaim that are named in the Mishnah, in a Braita, in a Tosefta, anywhere. Is there anywhere that we find the name of this person? Uh, so here's number one. Ben Yaakov, he did none. We have a Mishnah. It's a little bit later in, in this pedic of Mishnayot. It says, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Omer, Moshkin et hamay me'ilan ne'ilan, obad bilbad shelo yashket ha'sadeh kula. So let's say you have a, a, an orchard, you have a lot of trees, and you have a lot of water near one tree, and then the next tree over, or the other trees, have no water. And so you want to bring the water, so you want to make a little uh, channel, and uh, bring the waters from one tree to another. That's permitted because if a tree doesn't get any water, it will die. And therefore, this is a case of financial loss and financial loss is permitted. What you cannot do is 
uh, uh, water the entire field because watering the entire field, well, that is only for gain. You don't, it doesn't, you, the, the whole field doesn't need, I mean, it'll grow more, right? But really all you need to, for the tree to stay alive is to bring it right to the tree, to the roots. Um, the roots underneath are spread out. So if you bring water to the entire field, it will be beneficial for profit, uh, but, um, not, uh, but not necessary. And that would be a lot of work. And so that's, there, there we see at least principle number one that you can do, um, you can uh, do work if it will prevent financial loss. Okay, so it's a half of a good answer. So yeah, we do see from here that according to the B'Ali Eliezer Ben Yaakov, uh, doing something for profit to bring water to the whole thing is not allowed. So yes, principle number one is checked. But it's not clear from here what he would say about doing a, a lot of work, extra exertion, in a case of, uh, of financial loss. Because here, um, that we don't have that case here. There's no, there's no, the financial loss would only be for the, to bring water to the trees themselves, but that doesn't require a lot of exertion. If it required a lot of exertion, would it still be allowed? It doesn't say here. So therefore... It's not, we cannot prove that B.L. Ezebin Yaakov is the author. It could be, but not necessarily. You know, it's going to be the Buda in the following B'raita. The following B'raita is, has a lot of cases and actually it's three different opinions. So it's going to have a lot of material that isn't specifically necessary to answer our question. But we're going to focus in on, on, on the Buda. Okay. The Tanya, Ma'ayana Yosef Betechila. Is the most lenient. And he says, even a new spring, you're allowed to use that water for a field that does not require irrigation. That means that's only for profit because it doesn't need the irrigation. I just want to want to grow a little extra. So I'm going to give some extra water that's permitted. And you can even use a spring that's a new spring, even though perhaps the, uh, the, the walls will fail and you'll have to go and fix it and you have to do ex, extra exertion. Okay, that's Bimeir, who's definitely more lenient than our Mishnah. Then we have Rabbi Yudha Omer, and Mashkin Ela Sedeh Betashlachin Shechareva. Rabbi Yudha disagrees and says, well, if you have a new spring, no, no, to be Meir, you can only use a new spring for a betashlachin for uh, one that, uh, uh, field that requires irrigation. So you see, that is like our Mishnah. Now he adds a word, shecharva, that has been destroyed and has dried up. Okay, the Gemara will explain what this word means. So we'll come back to that. Rabbi al but so far you see that Rabbi Yudah fits our Mishnah. Rabbi al ben Azariah Omer, lo kach ve lo kach. Rabbi al ben Azariah, he's quoted in our Mishnah as being the more stringent one. And again, here he's more stringent and he says, I don't agree with either of you. You cannot use uh, such a spring, not for uh, this type of field and not for that type of field. No, not allowed at all. Good. That's three opinions. Now we add something else. Yater al ken amar biudar biudar add another law. Lo yafne adam amatamayim v'yashke leginato l'chobato b'cholon shamo ed. You can't take an existing channel, existent water channel, and divert it from its regular path, as so that you can move it to your garden or to a ruin. A ruin is uh, things would grow on top of the ruin. And you want to get water there on Cholamoed because that requires a lot of exertion. It's similar to making a whole new channel. All right, so that's the Braita. Now we want to explain that extra word, Shecharva, that dried up. My Charva, Ile Macharva Mamash. If you're talking about a field that totally dried up, Lama Lide Mashkila, then it's no good. It won't even help to give it water. Uh, so it should, well, then it wouldn't be allowed at all. No, it means that it's not the field that dried up, but rather the spring dried up. One spring, it was dependent. I had a field dependent on one spring that was there. That spring dried up, but then the water came out from somewhere else, a new spring. And so that's what it means, um, and uh, even a new spring uh, that replaces an old spring would be permitted. And so this is still in accord with our Mishnah that says, an old spring or a new spring, you can use for uh, an irrigated field because that would otherwise that would be financial loss. 
Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah Omer, lo kach ve lo kach. That's what he said in, the, in this Beraita. And the, what does he mean by that? Lo shena charav ma'yana, ve lo shena lo charav ma'yana. Ma'yan she yasa betechila, lo. What he, what he means is either way, he's responding directly to the Buda and says, e, whether it's, uh, doesn't matter if it's uh, a spring that dried up, or it doesn't, doesn't matter if it didn't dry up and it was there before, a new one, an old one. Um, and uh, uh, any any spring that came up from from new is no good. Whether whether it replaces an old one or it's completely new, uh, any kind any kind of new spring may not be used. That's what he means. Okay. Now, so that is uh, proving that the Buddha seems to be in accordance with our Mishnah. Therefore, he could be the author. And we challenge it. We may. This paraita only talked about a new spring, right? That was the case that Rabbi uh, Meir talked about. So from this paraita, um, I would only know that Rabbi Uda says, yes, you can use a new spring for an irrigated field, but not for a non-irrigated field. Um, uh, that be, if, if it's a new spring, but uh, because it might fall. But if it's an old spring, where I don't have to worry about the walls falling, maybe I can even use that for a non-irrigated field. So therefore, it's not totally clear that a biuda has to be the author of a Mishnah. Uh, so what are we going to do now? Wait a second. Now you're leaving us with no possibilities. You already rejected Rabbi Eliezer, Ben Yaakov. You're, now you're rejecting Rabbi Yehuda. There's nobody left. There's nobody in any of any other bed I taught that, that is anywhere comparable to the opinion of Artan Nakama. It has to be someone that, right, that we know. I mean, there is an assumption here that we have a sufficient corpus of bed I taught that would include any opinion that's in the Mishnah. And so, uh, therefore, we say, Ella, the Debiuda, Lashena Mayan, Shea Sabatechila, Velashena Mayan, Sheloya Sabatechila, Beta Shlichin, Beta Bal Las. You know what? I'll go with it. It's got to be the Buda. It can't be anybody else. And we're going to say now that for the Buda, he agrees with the Mishnah. That doesn't matter whether it's a new spring or an old spring. Any kind of spring can be used for an irrigated field, but not for a rain, depend, a rain field. Um, good. If so, why did the Braita only talk about a case of a new spring? Because it wanted to teach you the extent of the leniency of the Bimeir that even a new spring you can use for a, a non irrigated field, uh, even though it's only for profit. And even though it's a new spring, so that's what Bimeir, and he was first. The Buddha comes and he was responding to that. That's why he didn't expand it and say whether it's new or old. But in fact, he would agree with the same distinction, whether it's new or old. All right, excellent. And now we go into some laws of Shabbat. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but we're going to use our conclusion to come back to our Mishnah. And ask an important question about shivit, right? Well, why is what's what's the problem of watering on shivit? That's what we're going to come to. Itmar, hamenakesh v'hamet mashke ma'im lizra'im b'shabbat mishumai matrinan be. Someone who pulls weeds or uh, provides water uh, waters uh, the uh, um, uh, 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 a field on Shabbat. So both of these are prohibited. The question is for what melacha? If you see someone doing that. If you see someone doing a melacha on Shabbat, you have to warn them. It's not enough just to say, hey, you're violating Shabbat. You have to tell them which of the 39 melachot they are violating, right? If the person is going to be um, is sowing, you have to tell them, you are violating the melacha of sowing, right? And so you have to specify exactly, right? Just like in a, in a court today, if uh, not for the warning, but rather for the sentencing, you have to say, right, you violated uh, the, the code uh, 324046 b of the this uh, this law code and so on. Okay, so what we want to know is these two items are not one of the 39 melachot. And so we want to know what category do they fit in uh, if you're pulling weeds and watering, uh, watering a field. So we have a machloket, a fascinating one. Rabba Amar Mishum Choresh, Rabbi Yosef Amar Mishum Zoreya. Rabba says both of these are about plowing. 
plowing prepares the field so that um, so that things will grow be better. Uh, we'll see. And Rav Yosef says it's zoreya, it's uh, planting. What's explained? What does plowing do? It softens the earth. And so too, the same here. If I'm pulling weeds, right? I'm taking those weeds out. And by doing that, I'm softening and improving the earth. And also if I'm watering the field, I am softening and improving the earth so that things can grow better. Therefore, these are in the category of plowing. If I see someone doing this, I have to say, you should know that you are you are violating plowing. Maybe he doesn't know, and he better stop, right? Or else. I'm out of Yosef Kevati DD, Mr. Beramada Koshel Zorel Samoche Pera, Haname Mesamach Pera. So, no, I think it's planting, sowing, because when you plant something, that will cause it to grow. And so, too, if I take out the weeds, then that will cause it to grow better. And if I water it, that will also cause the fruit to grow better. And so that's, uh, it's in, this, in, this, in the category of planting. All right, now, Abaye is going to challenge uh, the, first, uh, the, the first statement and say, And my, I have a challenge on Rav Yosef also. Okay, Abaye has a challenge on both opinions. Equally, you're going to Yudaba. You only violate plowing, but not planting. Why not planting? And for Yosef, you only violate planting, but not plowing. Why not? Right? Actually, you're violating both because you're both softening the earth and you're also about making it grow. And maybe you'll counter and say, no, there's a principle. Anytime you do one action, uh, um, uh, that even though it fits into two categories, you'll only be prohibited once, right? You can't, you, there's, there's no uh, d d um, double jeopardy here, right? You can't do one action and be liable for on two, two different counts. It has to fit into one category or the other. If you would say that, and that's why we have a machlok, it has to be either this one or that one, but that's not true. Listen to this case. Someone who is um, pruning. And now when you uh, prune uh, like a vi you know, some vines, Right, so you're taking off the uh, old, uh, uh, all weak ones or dead ones, and that actually helps it grow uh, because uh, the plant doesn't have to exert energy on those uh, useless branches, and so that on the one that helps it grow. But in this case, you are you have two things in mind. Number one, uh, you're going to improve the vines, and I actually need the wood. I'm going to go and use the wood and and uh, make a fire, as so you use it, you know, later on for uh, for firewood. So in this case, I'm actually liable to two melachot for one action. Number one, because of notea, planting, even though I'm not planting, I'm doing something that will help it grow. I'm improving it by pruning. And second, koser. Koser means reaping. Now, reaping is only, only applicable when I remove something from a live plant and that I want, that I want to use to eat later or to burn later. So in this case, I'm doing one action and actually have in mind both benefits. And so in this case, I am chayav too, kashya. So this is really difficult. Really, it could be both. And there's no reason to have to choose only one or the other, right? Rabban Rav Yosef, you should, you should both agree with each other and say both. All right, that's a good question. We leave it as a question. We don't answer it. But we go back to an internal dialogue. Iti be Rav Yosef, Rabban Rav Yosef who said, planting, asks Rabam, nakesh v'mechapel l'kil ayim, loke. Rabbi Yud Al-Kiba omer, af ha-mekayim. So from the following b'raita, that says, someone who is, uh, pulls out weeds um, uh, uh, or covers kil ayim, covers like you, know, you can see the roots of it, and so you bring more dirt and cover it up so that it will, uh, it will be under the dirt and grow well. Um, this person is loke. This is talking about kil, uh, uh, talking about kil ayim. So the problem with kil ayim, you can't you can't plant two diverse kinds together. In this case, uh, I'm, I'm uh, taking out weeds that are near it. So that indirectly will help the one of the species of kil ayim or both. Uh, it's helping them grow. 
So I'm, I didn't plant it, but I'm helping them grow. So therefore, you one get lashed, one get get slashes for that. And if I cover up the roots, even though I'm not planting the kilayim, I'm helping them grow. So therefore, I also get flogged for helping kilayim. That's Tanakama. Then Rabbi Akiva comes and says, even if I don't do any action, right? So according to the first one, I have to do some action to be liable kilayim. According to Rabbi Akiva, even if I do no action, if I just see it, there and I don't uproot it, I am liable and uh, would be would would be flogged, right? So I have to actively go and uproot it and uh, be li- and be liable even for just being passive and not uprooting it. Okay, so that's the machloket. Now we're gonna try to explain the tanakama here. According to me, Rabbi Yosef says, says that I think the problem with, uh, with uh, taking out the weeds is planting. So it makes sense that uh, planting, if I plant kilayim, I uh, would be liable. So too, if I take out the weeds, that is a subcategory of planting. And that's why I'm liable here. But according to you, Rabbi, you say that taking out weeds is a problem of plowing, but there's no problem, there's no prohibition of plowing regarding kilayim, because plowing, by definition, you're plowing the field, that means there's nothing there growing, right? You're overturning the, uh, you're, you're turning over the, um, the, the, the dirt, and there's nothing, there's nothing there. So if, uh, if you say that, taking out the weeds is a problem of plowing, then it should not be a problem of kilayim, and you have no way to explain the Tanakama of this little b'raita. Oh, it's a great question. Amale Mishume Kayem, Rabba says, no, I have an answer, that someone who's, uh, someone who's taking out the weeds is, is uh, the pro- his problem is, is he's not, he's leaving the kilayim there. And so he's liable even for being passive, like Rabbi Akiva says. Wait a second. How could he be say that? You can't say that because he didn't any be agreeing with Rabbi Akiva. But we want to explain the uh, what how how would Abba would we want to know how Abba would explain Rabba would explain the Tanakama. And since the Rabbi Akiva is the one that says passively just by leaving Kilayim there, I'm liable. So that means for Tanakama, I am not liable for passively leaving it there, only if I do some action. And if that action is, is taking out the weeds is a, is a subcategory of plowing, then I shouldn't be liable because there's no category of plowing for Kilayim. Okay, his answer is So Rabbi could reread the Sobaraita and say that it's all the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. There's no machloket here. And it's explaining the reason. First, it says anyone who takes out weeds or puts dirt on, adds dirt onto the roots of the species of Kilayim is liable. Why? Because he's leaving it there. It doesn't matter whether he does an action or not. These actions are kind of indirect um, because Rabbi Akiva says, even if I do nothing and leave it there, I am liable. So all the more so if I take out the weeds or put uh, other dirt. And therefore, uh, that would explain uh, that although he's not actually doing any melacha, uh, that would be a problem for kilayim because uh, uprooting weeds is the same as plowing and plowing is okay. And nevertheless, just by leaving it there is the problem. Okay, now my Tamad Rabbi Akiva, what's Rabbi Akiva's source to say that passively uh, uh, leaving Kilayim and letting it grow is prohibited? So the Pasuk explicitly only says, don't plant uh, mixed seeds in your, uh, in your garden. Uh, so that's only if I do it actively. If it grows by itself and I let it, how do I know that that's also prohibited? We are repunctuating the pasuk. It says the pasuk says et chukotai tishmoru behemtecha lo tirba tarbiya kilayim kama sadecha lo tizra kilayim kama. So the first case is animals cannot be um, cannot make them work together. Different kinds of animals. Uh, it's not fair. The weak one, the strong one, and they'll it'll cause them suffering. Uh, so there it says kilayim kama. But what we're going to do, we're going to take the, the first word kilayim, even though it has a kef katon on it, which is a stopping, uh, a stopping ta'am. We're going to read that together with the next uh, phrase and say kilayim sadecha lo tizra, and then kilayim again. So by doing it that way, kilayim sadecha lo tizra, that includes the passive case that kilayim that's already there, 
No, don't let it stay there. You have to uproot it. And if you don't, one is liable even in a passive way. Very good. That ends the tangent regarding the laws of Shabbat. And now that we know that uh, what the problem of uh, giving water is, or watering a field is, now we're going to come back to our Mishnah. Tenan, mashkin bet ha-shlachin ba-mo'ed u ba-shevi'it. You're allowed to water a garden or a field that needs irrigation on the holiday and on shevi'it because otherwise they will die altogether and that will be a tremendous financial loss, so it's allowed. So we understand regarding mo'ed, even though it requires some work, um, but it's a case of loss, and therefore the rabbis say it's permitted in the case of loss to do, do a little bit of work. But according to on Shevi'it, why should you be allowed to water a garden? Whether you say it's Zorea, uh, like Rav Yosef, or whether you say it's, um, it's Choresh. Um, like Rabba. Either way, right? Still, both of these are melachot that you're not allowed to do on Shevit. Shevit, you can't work the land. And so, why is it permitted to water the garden on Shevit? So, Abaye says, this is going, we're going to follow. We're talking about a case of Shivit nowadays when it's only the Rabbanan. The laws of Shivit apply only mid Rabbanan, which, and that follows the opinion of the B. We see that in the following Braita when it says, This is the matter regarding Shemitah to Shamot, to release creditors. Right? There's two kinds, there's two laws on Shemitah, can't work the land, and you release all debts. And we see that in this double language, Hashemitah Shamot. So there's two kinds of Shemitah. And since they're connected in the Pasuk back to back, um, so we learned that they are similar to each other. When the, the release of the land that you have to let it uh, lie fallow applies, then the laws of releasing debts also applies. But when the first one doesn't apply, then releasing debts also does not apply. What do we see from here? That there are t- times in history when the laws of leaving the land fallow apply in times when it doesn't apply. What do you mean it doesn't apply? Oh, that's right. When the laws of Yovel don't apply, so too the laws of Shemitah do not apply deoraita. Nevertheless, they will apply dirabanan. But if it's dirabanan, it's more lenient. And the rabbis can uh, include an exclusion and say, if there's going to be a big financial loss and if you don't water the, the, the land for a whole year, it's going to be really destroyed even after that. So the rabbis can make an exception and say, uh, in the case of Hefsed, uh, it's per- permitted. And that's why, um, uh, no matter what, whatever the melacha is of watering, it's permitted because it's called, talking about a case when it's, uh, when it's not the oraita. Rava Amar, and last answer, afilu tema rabbanan. No, we can even follow the rabbanan against the bee, who say that shivit applies the oraita, even nowadays. And nevertheless, avot asarachamana toladot la asarachamana, that on Shevi'it, you are prohibited from doing the 39, not no, doing the milachot, the, the, the main categories that have to do with working the land, um, right? Uh, 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 um, plowing, sowing, and so on. Um, but the subcategories, and that would be include watering and weeding, those are subcategories. Those are, are okay. You can't do them on Shabbat, but you're, you can do them on Shavit. How do we know? Shabbat Shabbaton lo tizra. So since it says on the Shavit, this is like a Shabbat, and your field you should not sow, and your vineyard should not prune, and so on. Since it goes and specifies these specific things that we say, Why do I, I need examples of, uh, of, of planting both in, both in a, a plant and in a vineyard, right? Why do I need examples of both? 
um, if I know that it's the same thing, or plucking, right? Picking grapes as opposed and 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 reaping uh, wheat, right? Those are the same category of melacha. Why is the pasuk go out of its way to say both examples? It's to teach that for these, these are toladot, these are the main categories. Anything that's going to fit into a main category is prohibited on, on Shavit, but anything that is a subcategory, that would be permitted. And therefore, even if you say they, um, that uh, Shavit is Doraita nowadays, nevertheless, on Shavit, you can't do the main categories, but you are allowed to do the Toladot, the subcategories, and that includes uh, that, that includes um, watering the field. Baruch Adonai Amen ve'amen.